So, uh, so this title, so you see that the title is slightly updated. I discovered when I was actually preparing this talk that it's five million years and now turned into uh, 10 million years um, in the time it took to get this paper published, which this talk is about. Uh, uh, so, so I'm going to do something quite unusual. So normally I work on, on Arabidopsis thaliana, on, and we've been doing lots of work on genome-wide association studies and, and, and so on, right? Um, today I'm going to do something uh, which I usually don't do, namely a talk, talk about stuff that's really not my work at all. And this is the story of the Arabidopsis librata uh, genome. Uh, so the genome sequence was produced by JGI uh, via the community sequencing program. And, and really the PI, the person who should be giving this talk, is Detlef Weigel, who was, who was driving this whole thing. So my group, um, in particular the lead author of the eventual paper, Tina Hu, uh, participated in the analysis of this. And there's a bunch of other people involved too, Brandon Gauth at UCI, Klaus Meyer in, in Munich, Yves van der Per in Ghent, and of, course, and of course lots of people here at the, the JGI. Um, right, so, so Arabidopsis lavrata, so the, the really the only, so it's, you have Arabidopsis lavrata on the, on the right here. Um, it is, and you have Faliana on the left. The, really the only reason for sequencing lavrata is as an, to use it as an outgroup for uh, Arabidopsis faliana. Because we, fo we found ourselves for the longest time that you have, so let me just contrast them quickly. You have um, uh, lavrata is a perennial, Thaliana is an annual. The different breeding system, Thaliana is of course uh, selfing and Lavrata is uh, an obligate outcrosser. The different chromosome number, Arabidopsis Lavrata has the ancestral number of eight, Thaliana has gone down to five. And they differ dramatically in genome size and that, that would be a big em emphasis here that the genome size of Lavrata is 207 megabases. And Thaliana is 125 megabases, it's a very small genome, and that's of course one of the reasons it ended up being a model organism. It was selected specifically because it was small, it was easy to work with and all that. And uh, when I started working on Thaliana, and actually for, for a long period, we had a really weird situation that you had an organism that was so incredibly well studied. We had lots and lots of polymorphism data. For many, for many years, it was outside humans uh, and to some extent maize, uh, Thaliana was, you know, they were, these three organisms were in a class of themselves of how much we knew about polymorphism, but we couldn't really make use of that because there was nothing to compare it to because this, the sequencing in plants is so spotty. And for those of you who are not really working on plants, people always tell me, would tell me, well, you know, can't you compare it to, you know, rice? Or can't you compare it to something? You, you really can't. Plant genomes evolve really fast and it's very difficult to, um, to know what's going on unless you have something closely related. Now, there is a lot of really close relatives of Thaliana with small genomes that you can do a lot with and that this is eventually happening now. Uh, let me see here. Oops. Right. Oh yeah, so I forgot to say the gene number also differs between uh, these two now. So we have so the genomes are sequenced, the different genome size, so these are now reasonably good estimates, 125, 207 megabases. However, the gene numbers are, are you know, the genes have been lost, but not, not that many. Okay. On, so from genetic mapping, it's been long for, known for quite a while that there have been major rearrangements. Um, so eight chromosomes is the ancestral, like I said, and you can infer that there's been a minimum of two reciprocal translocations and three chromosomal fusions to go down to this. And when you compare the two genomes, you can actually find uh, you know, remnants of the missing centromere and all that stuff, right? So on a big scale, you have these big changes. Nonetheless, it's quite easy to align these two genomes. On average, the uh, sequence divergence is about 12% if you go across. Uh, for, for the bits you can align, I should uh, hasten to add. And, and largely the genomes are collinear. So here you have a plot of, of all the genes divided into those that are collinear, those that have been transposed, a fair number of genes that have moved uh, locations, things that are duplicated, things that are really hard to say whether they're the same and things that are linear specific. And you can see that there's a, a good chunk of the genes that are, are still collinear and they occur in, in long runs of genes where you can easily line them as they're sitting uh, together. And at the point on both sides, so you can see that this plot here is sort of bimodal. You can see this on both sides here and that's basically because there tends to be short chunks that have been interrupted by you know, a single gene jumping, jumping in and out being transposed. But, and this is 
one of the, what I think, so Jeremy and I, so Jeremy Smuts and I sort of disagree on this perhaps. I, I think this is a very important question. They differ very, they differ greatly in size. And of course this is, to me this is a very interesting question. I mean, why do genomes differ so tremendously in size? And plants, you know, span several orders of magnitude in, in, in genome size, right? How does this actually happen? So in order to begin answering that question, you need to look at, well, what, what is it that actually changes? So if you now look at the bits of the genome, if you, if you do a whole genome alignment, uh, you divide it, the, all the base pairs into those that are alignable, and for those that are alignable, they can either match or they can mismatch, right? So you have this, this is the fraction of the size that mismatch, right? So this is about, in this case, it looks more like it's 15, 16% perhaps. And then you have a large chunk that is unalignable. And as you can see here, about 50% of the Arabidopsis larata, oops, there's a genome missing, appears to be missing from Arabidopsis thaliana. So that's approximately 114 megabases. Conversely, there's a good chunk of the Arabidopsis thaliana genome uh, that you can't find in, in, in larata. So that's uh, about 25% of the genome. So what is it? So here's a color code of, of, the, of the pieces. Um, the things that are unalignable, as you can see here, is the black bit, it's intergenic DNA, it's stuff that we don't know what it is, and it's transposable elements. The things you can align, of course, mostly is, is coding DNA. And as a result of this, right, uh, and you will also notice here, that the, and this is the same whichever comparison you do, right, if it's the bits that are missing from one or the other, uh, it's mostly the transposable elements and the intergenic DNA that you can't align. As a result of this, the net result of these changes then is that the Arabidopsis thaliana has become the, the excellent model system it is. It's, it's, you know, it's half of it, it's genes. Uh, you can look in, in thaliana here, you have the genic context is about 42% of the genome. In Lairata, the estimate is less than, and less than 30%. And what's gone missing, of course, is intergenic and, and transposable elements. So, so really, in some sense, it looks like Thaliana is, is a bare bones genome, right? You have stripped, strip, you, have gotten also, you have gotten rid of everything else, and even within the genes, we can see that the multi-gene families have gotten smaller, and if you do comparisons across lots of species, you find that um, there are very few species-specific genes in the Arabidopsis thaliana genome. So it looks like everything you find is found somewhere else. Now, I hasten to add that there are so many biases in doing these kind of analysis that you don't even really want to go down there, but it's, it's at least suggestive, right? Because it, of course it depends on how well the different genomes are annotated and all that. Okay, so how has this happened? Well, you can, imagine, uh, you can imagine many different ways it could happen, right? You could imagine that there are like big chunks. We know that three centimeters have been lost. However, it turns out that that accounts for no more than 10% of the differences in size. And when I say cuts here, of course, so now I, I should have remember <laughs> to remind myself here that I have a bias that this actually is cuts, that most of the differences are, are due to losses in Thaliana. But without, and we had a discussion about this at lunchtime just before, without having an out group, further out, right, we can't really rule out that it's all sort of been added in Larata instead. Uh, you know, given that the sort of, we have lost the centromeres, of course, we know that they have been lost, right? So there are all kinds of reasons. It's clearly most parsimonious to think that what we really are talking about is losses against the uh, Aliana lineage, but to really get specific about this, you need, you need an outgroup, of course. So anyway, if you know, so think about, I talk about cuts here, but basically of the indel differences then, um, the missing centromeres are about 10% of that difference, right? And the rest is due to hundreds of thousands of cuts throughout the genome. And here I realize I try to make all the figures bigger because I've been sitting here for two days looking at these, you know, the resolution of the screens here are not, not the greatest. And I realize you cannot read these numbers. But what we're looking at here is basically a histogram or a bar chart that shows you how many cuts there are of size one. So this is one base pair uh, in DELS. And what you see here is that there's about the same number in Lairata and Thaliana that you can't reciprocally um, align. Uh, base length two, length three, and so on, right? And where they are, and again, most of them are gonna be in intergenic DNA. Whoops, I'm standing too far forward, I guess. Um, thanks. And so a curious phenomenon here, and, right? So this is going up to, there's 150,000 or something of these, right? And the, the fewer and fewer as you go down here. Now we start grouping them into batches of 10, right? So this is 10 to 20 and, and so on, right? 
And, a, there's a, and you can see that there are basically many, many, many of the really small ones, right? Not so many of the bigger ones and so on. But what's really curious here, and this becomes important later on, is that when you look at these short ones, there appears to be no bias. I mean, there's as much chance of a, of a one base pair deletion uh, you know, being present in one species not in the other, whereas when you come down uh, to the longer ones, you start seeing a bias. So that stuff uh, is missing from Lyrata that you find, sorry, missing in Thaliana that you find in, in Lyrata. I mean, we know that there has to be a net difference, right, because the genome has shrunk. It's not at all obvious that, that this shouldn't affect everything in the same way, right? But it appears that the bias grows stronger uh, for the longer ones. Okay, where have the cuts happened? They've happened everywhere. So here is a plot. I'm just showing uh, the two first uh, Thaliana chromosomes. And what we have here is basically, well, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a measurement of how far apart uh, genes are in, in uh, averaged in, in, uh, in short windows. And uh, when it's above, that means that there's been a, a net loss. And here is a net, a, a net gain. Uh, and what you can see is that across uh, the entire chromosomes, you know, there, there are uh, losses and gains everywhere. However, it is not random, and you can probably see here, the, uh, this underneath here is the large scale of rearrangement with respect to the ancestral genome. So here, for instance, there's been a bunch of inversions, right? Here is one of those chromosomal fusions between the ancestral uh, uh, Lyrata chromosomes, right? And you can see that there's more of these things going on here. And you can quantify that. If <clears throat> so here's the same measurement again, looking at length in 100 kV windows of Lyrata length versus Faliana length on a log 2 scale, right? So uh, if it's on, on, on this side, it's a net loss. And what you can see here is that in, in regions that have been rearranged, there is uh, many more uh, large, large losses. Okay, so, so now let's go back to what, so what, what I really think is interesting in this and the part that sort of we, we participated in most in is thinking about why, why does the genome change? Well, so formally there are three possibilities, right? It could just be random. You know, just by chance you can lose, you know, the genome can be shorter or longer. Okay, so with 100,000 different deletions, we can rule that one out, right? It's like a random walk, larger, law of large numbers applies. You cannot just do this by drift. There has to be a bias. So then there are two possibilities. The bias can be at the mutation process, right? There can be something that changes in DNA or pair or whatever, right? So there's a, preponder, you know, there's a, a, a mechanism for just making genomes shorter every time uh, you replicate. Uh, or there can be a transmission bias. So for example, selection, right? That shorter things, um, have a, 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 an advantage over longer things, for example. Or you can imagine, you know, formally that could also be some kind of biased gene conversion process, right? Something that, uh, that causes one length of the other to be transmitted. Uh, and uh, if you read the, the literature, especially the plant, the plant um, genome, comparative genomic literature, is actually it's pretty lousy if you go in and if you read this carefully. These things, thinking about which, which it is, is usually quite muddled. And, and one reason for that is, of course, that you know, if you only have a couple of genomes to compare, there is really no way of distinguishing them, right? Just comparing pairs of genomes cannot reveal the source of the bias, right? Given that one genome is shorter than the other, you know that things will have been lost rather than gained. I mean, you can make arguments, for instance, here, that if it were a mutation mechanism that causes this, right, why then would it, you know, based on this thing here, that you only see a bias once you get deletions that are longer than, say, 10 base pairs. Well, you start seeing them, and the bias gets stronger the longer they are, right? I mean, there's nothing, you know, then you, you can imagine some kind of repair mechanism that shows more of a bias uh, this way. Or you can imagine, as an alternative for this, that selection is favoring losing larger chunks, right? Okay, there can be either of those. However, there's a very clear way you can distinguish it, and that's using polymorphism data. So we, we rounded up, uh, for analyzing these data, we, we got a hold of some really old polymorphism data that my lab generated, uh, well-curated alignments for about 1,500 loci, where you can look very carefully at the introns and, and line them up. And that gave, I think, a, a rather dramatic picture of what's, what's going on. What, so what you're looking at here is the 
derived allele frequencies, so the frequency of new mutations. Uh, and you have synonymous SNPs and non-synonymous SNPs and insertions and deletions, right? And typically, if you're used to looking at these things, right, most alleles, most new alleles will be rare, right? And you'll have a tail going out like this, and then you'll have some things that go up towards close to becoming fixed in the population. And you can very easily see there's a dramatic difference here that all the deletions um, appear to have been pushed towards high frequency, right? There's this spike out here, whereas if you look at the insertions, they actually look more skewed towards rare alleles than most SNP variation, right? Indicating some kind of selection against them. So this is a, you know, by genomic standards, a pretty small number of, of points we have here. But it's still pretty clear evidence, and I think, or, as far as I know, one of the first evidence of this kind, that selection actually has been acting to make the genome smaller. Uh, how exactly that works, I mean, I've been struggling thinking about this myself, you know, how can you, how ca what strength of selection would you have to remove 10 base pairs in the intron somewhere in the genome, right? It, it, it would take a pretty big population size to make this actually, actually work, right? And then there are arguments about what kind of selective load would it be to remove so many of these in, in the time that's been involved. But nonetheless, what, you, what I think, the, sort of the working hypothesis here is that you have so not only is the Arabidopsis thalia, so not only has it been selected to shrink, the process is still ongoing. And this has implications then for, I'll get back to that in a second, for analyzing polymorphism data in Thaliana, because what, what you're saying then is that you basically, st the Thaliana genomes you see today are a mosaic of different kinds of losses uh, of stuff that still present perhaps in the ancestral genome. Okay, so just to summarize what I said to this point, uh, so the difference in genome size is due to hundreds of thousands of indels, disproportionately affecting non-coding DNA and transposable elements, and as a result making Arabidopsis thaliana gene-rich. And it seems likely, although I'm, you know, happy to change my mind if, if outgroup data proves otherwise, that most of these changes are in fact deletions in Arabidopsis thaliana. And polymorphism data supports this by suggesting that deletions are um, selectively favored. Right, okay, so that's the end of the uh, coherent part of this talk. So now, so when I, when I sort of uh, was invited to give, to, uh, give a presentation here, I thought, well, I should really talk about the Larata genome because this is, uh, you know, work that GDI was doing, right? And even though the data, so the, this data, the, this paper describing all this is coming out soon in, in uh, Nature Genetics. But in some sense, it's, it's sort of old data. And I was hoping, well, look, we're going to have, so we're going to have all this Arabidopsis polymorphism data to illuminate this. Um, so that turned out to be a little bit too optimistic, right? So I'm a part of the uh, 1001 Genomes Project for uh, Arabidopsis thaliana. Uh, the goal is mostly to, to sequence all these embryo lines, which is one of the fantastic resources you have in Arabidopsis, as you have naturally adapted lines from all over the world. Uh, that we can use for basically functional work, evolutionary work, whatever, just trying to understand the connection between genotype and phenotype. We've done a lot of work with genome-wise association mapping. We developed a SNP chip. We did all the stuff that uh, the human HapMap project has done, right? And it's really, you know, completely stupid and a waste of time, right? Because we, the sequencing is coming so quickly, right, that all this SNP efforts just kind of out to be uh, nonsense. And I'm predicting that that's going to be true for for almost any organism you can think of. Okay, so the 1001 Genomes Project is collaboration with lots of people. So Detlef Weigel again played a major role. Uh, my lab has sequenced about, uh, two, we're sequencing about 200 Swedish lines. We have done about 160 of those. Joe Ecker is doing an, a number. Monsanto has committed to doing 500. Uh, Richard Mott, Joy Bergelson is collecting all these plants. Okay. And the goal here is to basically, you know, take the mapping out of mapping, right? Because if you think about the whole literature of genetic mapping, it's really there's a lot of ink spilled over trying to infer what's going on over here based on what you see here, right? So this is, if you think about it, really stupid. Much better would be to just look at what's going on over here, right? So you can get rid of all that. And that's what we're trying to do here. So I'll just show you uh, some of the preliminary plots now. So this is, now you have to excuse me, there'll be no, no attempt to make the labels coherent or anything like this. This is just plots that graduate students send me late at night kind of things. So here, here is one of our GWAS plots. I don't even know what phenotype this is. It doesn't matter. We have 700 of them um, in, in our database. And you have green dots and blue dots. And the green dots are 250K SNPs and the blue dots are, uh, so we have 250,000 SNPs. This I think is now up to 1.7 million SNPs or something like that from 
and, but there's something like 5 million SNPs that we're trying to verify and put in there. When you do genome-wide association mapping, it doesn't really matter so much if a lot of the SNPs you put in are crap, right? Because putting in crap isn't going to really give you any strong associations. It matters for other things, obviously. So what you can see, I mean, when we do this, right, you, you can see what you, um, well, basically, we have said in writing, we, as in, actually in this case, as in, as in me, have said in writing that, you know, the 250K SNPs is enough to cover the genome. That turns out to be broadly correct in the sense that you can tag things really well. Uh, but, of course, there's still SNP islands in the, you know, where there was too complicated. We couldn't actually see what was going on. So you miss things there. And I think, for instance, here is an example of this, right? Here is the spike that comes up new. But it turns out that you also learn a heck of a lot more about the details when you get in there. So, for instance, here's another data set. So this is another late... So we have also, so we have these 200 Swedish lines that we're sequencing. Uh, we've done mRNA seq in all these in, in, in different temperatures. So I just wanted to show you one of these. Uh, so here is mRNA seq. You have expressed gene position uh, versus uh, SNP position here. And all five chromosomes, which you of course cannot read at all, but you're only supposed to be, see this big fat diagonal on here, right? So these are all the cis -regula regulatory mutations that just pop up like this, right? And we have the full sequence data. We'll be able to basically nail almost all of these. Uh, and there, there is a lot, lot of it here, right? So this is like, you know, there's a big literature on EQTL, right? Uh, which has always uh, seemed a bit of a waste to me, right? Because basically, at the expression level, you have gene, gene level resolution. But because you're working on RILs or something like that, you have massive megabase resolution on the other scale. So there are then oodles and oodles of papers on arguing whether something is cis or trans or whatever. But when you do GWAS with this, you really are down to individual genes on both axes, right? And we can really see what's going on. And of course, working in Arabidopsis, we can do this in, in uh, multiple environments and so on. Here's an example where having all the data helps, right? So here's another GWAS plot. This is a blow up again, right? So the green dots here are the, are the 250K SNPs. I should actually be honest and point on both sides. Here's the green one. I apologize again. If I had had time, I would have recolored these dots, but this is something someone sent me. In the original GWAS, then, we saw that there was something in this whole entire region here, right? We tagged something here. But when you add all the other SNPs, you sort of see very clear peaks popping up where, where there is uh, actually something going on. So, okay, so that's the GWAS thing. Now, so, right, so my original plan was also to have uh, the data I showed you about selection on the lesions. I was hoping that we would have all the indel variations in these lines ready so we could actually look at a much larger sample size of what the pattern of selection of these are. Turns out that actually calling these reliably is much harder than we had anticipated, so we're not there yet. However, we can get back to one so getting back now to molecular evolution, I, I told you this is going to be somewhat incoherent. Um, uh, we can get back to one, observa one observation that we've been wanting to look at for, for a long time, which is from a, a paper uh, that we published. This is, again, Detlef was the sen senior author in this in Science in 2007, where he had Pearl gene resequence um, 20 Arabidopsis lines. And we observed this really wacky phenomenon here. Of, so this is the five chromosomes, and you're looking at... Uh, diversity at fourfold degenerate sites across the genome. And you see this extreme macro scale pattern of high diversity in regions surrounding all the centromeres. So this is the centromeres, right, on all chromosomes. Here are, the, here are the centromeres. You have these big blobs here. This used to be a centromere. Here's one of these rearranged regions where there's been a fusion between two chromosomes. So we, we saw this, right, and this is really quite remarkable. What, I mean, Classical population analysis theory doesn't predict this at all, that you have fourfold differences in, in diversity over megabase scales when linkage to equilibrium decays over a 5 kb scale. However, with this chip data that was used to genotyping here, right, and without an outgroup, there are lots of possibilities, right? Could this just be due to chromosomal level differences in mutation rates? Could be. You need a mutation, you need an outgroup to correct for that. Uh, with chip data, you don't really know what you're looking at exactly. There's all kinds of possibilities of gene duplications, and you don't really know how, how, how accurate it is. Now, however, we have sequence data, we have an outgroup, and you can really confirm this data. So here's like the latest. This is looking now that, that, at synonymous polymorphism corrected by the divergence from Dirata at very well aligned uh, synonymous sites in genes. Uh, and now, at least I can say that the phenomenon is certainly real, and it's, it's, it's very, very strong, right? So you can see here there's a, about a fourfold difference in, in polymorphism 
there's some blips here and there. This is doing it like a mega-based window. There's something that affects polymorphism at, at, at this scale here, so that out on the arms, on all the chromosomes, uh, you go below average here. The, the lines here are the mean for each chromosome, right? So you go down below average, go down below average. Okay, so now at least we know that the observation is real. I'm out of time, right, I assume. Sorry. Uh, so we know the observation is real. Um, we still don't know what causes it. The working hypothesis is that it's recombination rate variation. Selection, um, tightly linked genes, selection, mostly purifying selection, but probably also selective sweeps, affecting polymorphism regionally and sort of wiping out variation. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're exploring all, all, all possible explanations, and, and next time I hope I'll have an, an answer to, to this question, as good as you ever get answers to these questions. So with that, I'm going to finish. Thanks.